Uh, I just came from speaking to the California Medical Association. They were down at Disneyland. And we walked around Disneyland a little bit. I can tell you that talking about health system reform, it's not a small world. This is a very contentious, very conflict-ridden issue. It's, it's divided the country in very many ways, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in terms of our values. But this is from the AMA's perspective. This is the perspective of the American Medical Association. We think that we need to have access and coverage for all Americans. We think we do need to control costs. We need to improve quality. Absolutely no question about it. We, have, we want to seek medical care that's patient-centered, safe, effective, efficient, equitable, and timely. But when you look at American values, you look at the values of freedom, autonomy, choice, competition, and we're a capitalistic society. We, we do things on the market. And if you, if you delve a little further, we also have the value about fairness and justice. And a lot of the debate is about how much do we give to the individual and how much do we divide up among the community. If we had a lot more time, and perhaps we can discuss this on the panel, this is part of what the debate is all about. Well, the AMA took a position uh, a couple of years ago, recognizing that we had at that time, I think it was 42 million uninsured, now it's up to 46 plus million uninsured. We considered this a national tragedy. People were living sicker and dying younger. Uh, thousands are dying every year solely because they do not have health insurance coverage. We developed this program, The Voice for the Uninsured. It, we, we did it during the presidential primaries. Uh, we brought it out to all the primaries. We wanted to make sure that whoever was elected president, that this would be the top domestic priority, and we're pleased that it has been. So we have invested greatly in making sure that we would get this issue in the, in the minds of the public. Now, what are the AMA's criteria for health system reform? What are the things that are most important? This is based on a lot of policy that we have of the, at the AMA, but they are simply that we want to make sure that we protect the patient-physician relationship, that decisions are made between the patient and their physician and not interfered with by the government or by health insurers. We want to make sure that everyone has affordable health care coverage. We want to make sure that there is promotion of quality, prevention, and wellness in this legislation. We want to repeal the Medicare payment system. Dr. Altman mentioned that a little bit. I'll talk about it a little bit more. This is a very flawed system. Each year, we, we, we have to go back to Congress to make sure that physicians aren't cut in their payments. We're concerned that that will limit uh, seniors' access to care. And indeed, a lot of primary care physicians are dropping or not taking new Medicare patients because they're concerns about the, the payment system. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, medical liability concerns, defensive medicine uh, is, is dealt with in some way in the, in the legislation and that the administrative burdens that we as physicians go through every day in terms of trying to seek approval to get care for people and then trying to make sure that we actually get paid for it, that that is eased in the, in the legislation. So that, that at a very high level is what we're looking for. Now here, here's the curve. Uh, there's not much that's going down nowadays in ter except the economy, but uh, when you look at the, the curve, you see that uh, it's going up in terms of healthcare costs. We're at about $2 trillion a year. And what Dr. Altman mentioned about bending the curve, uh, let me just mention that the president called uh, some of the biggest healthcare sectors into, into the administration this year and said, how can we get that increased rate of inflation down? How can we find some $2 trillion in savings? He did get assurances from all the parts of the healthcare sector to make that happen. Now, that's not written into the legislation. We'll see if that actually occurs. We're going to be meeting again with the president in May. But he has basically gotten a pledge from the big parts of the healthcare industry to try to get that inflation rate down, to try to bend that curve. And that's what Dr. Altman was talking about. Again, uh, we spend a lot more money than other developed countries. There's no question about it. And there are concerns that in some areas we're doing a lot better than some other countries, but in a lot of other countries they're doing better than we are. No question that we have many very good things about our healthcare system, but there's also no question that we can do better. Now, a little bit about the Medicare dilemma that I mentioned. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the bottom curve, if Congress doesn't fix the Medicare payment formula every year, then that's where the physician payments are down on that, that bottom curve, and physician practice costs are on the top curve. So it, most physicians are in small practices. Uh, even though there are some large 
group practices, about two thirds of physicians are in small practices. They're, all, they're trying to run a business and keep a practice going, pay their staff. And if, the, if, they're, if they're, the money they're, get, they're getting from Medicare is going down like that and their practice costs are going up, that's, that's why we have this dilemma with Medicare payment. Everyone in Congress agrees with that. And then if you look at the total Medicare spending, uh, if things keep going the way they are, it's just going to go off the chart. Uh, Medicare is going to go bankrupt. So clearly, there is a, a, it's an unsustainable situation. And so we agree with Congress, we agree with the President, that the status quo in terms of the cost and what we're doing is really unacceptable. We do need to make things different. Now, one, uh, one interesting recent... Uh, a uh, survey that was done by the Sherlock Company. They were trying to com compare administrative costs in Medicare and the private plans, and there's been a, a great deal of discussion about how perhaps Medicare has less administrative costs. So this is a study that was done of uh, about 36 Blue Cross and Blue Shield plans, and, and what they're thinking was that a lot of the data that had been comparing administrative costs before was from very old data. Uh, and if you look at the, the costs here, it looks like uh, the Medicare costs are about 13 plus percent and the private plan costs are about 12 and a half percent. So I think we need to dig a little bit deeper into this to see whether this, this goes across uh, states and across, uh, across different health plans. But it, it's, it is a, a, an issue of debate about, on the Medicare side, whether the administrative costs are really significantly less or actually they're more than the private plans. Now what about the public plan? Uh, now, nobody knows what the public plan is or what the public option is. And um, the AMA doesn't have any policy on public option because we don't know what it is. But uh, what, we, what we do think is if there is going to be a public option, and we are open to listening about what, what a public option would, will be. We haven't, we haven't signed on to it, but we are open to listening about it. We think if there is one, that physicians should be able to participate in a voluntary way. We think that patients should have a choice, not be forced into one particular plan. We think that the public plan should be uh, subject to the same set of regulations that private plans are. So we, we think there should be competition in the market if they're in the market. And we think that the public plan ought to be self-sustaining. It shouldn't be a constant drain on the Treasury so that if it gets up and running, it should keep going. And we think that the premium should be set by the market and that they should not be linked to Medicare rates. Now again, we, we don't know uh, what, the, what the public option is going to be, uh, and uh, early uh, in the summer, the AMA did support and, and, no, and issued its support for House Bill 3200, which included a public option, but we were pretty sure that it was going to change and we weren't sure how it was going to come out. We have gotten support for taking that position. We've also gotten castigated for that position. So we've gotten it from all sides, from our physician community, and there is division among the physician community. But we wanted to make sure that we would keep that process going. We wanted to make sure that something would go through the House, because we want to make sure that health reform legislation gets passed this year. Uh, on the other side of this, uh, the other side of the public plan and the whole issue of competition, this, this chart basically, the bluer it is, means that that's how concentrated that particular state is in terms of the health plans in that state. So if it's really dark blue, that means that only a couple, there, are, there are only a, a couple of insurers in the states that are dark blue. So what we've seen over the course of the last couple of decades is that every state has two or three uh, insurers which basically dominate the market. And from our point of view, that also reduces competition. And, and from the physician point of view, since we're unable to join together because of antitrust laws, that puts physicians in a very difficult position in terms of trying to negotiate with, uh, with the insurers. Okay, so what, what are the AMA's goals for legislation? What would we like to see out of the legislation? We want to make sure, again, that Americans are provided with uh, high quality, affordable health insurance. We want to make sure that they reflect the needs of America's patients and physicians. We want to have a permanent fix to the Medicare payment formula. We want there to be a push for liability reform. We want it to support primary care, prevention, wellness, and health IT. And we want to make sure it's financially sound. So that whatever is passed, we want to make sure that there's not an expectation for the American public that something is going to be delivered, but there's not enough money in the system to actually make it occur. Well, the president came. He was the second president to address the House of Delegates, the AMA. He came in June. It was a, it was a wonderful experience. He told us that he recognized that liability issues and the cost of defensive medicine was a significant concern and needed to be addressed. He also told us he was not in favor of caps on non-economic damages, 
But he, he did say that he would help us in terms of trying to move the issue of liability reform and defensive medicine uh, uh, forward. So what he did was he authorized HHS to provide $25 million in grants to states to do pilot projects on health courts, uh, early, early offers, other things basically on the lines of trying to improve patient safety. Because I think what we're all about, what, what we've seen is that the medical liability system doesn't improve patient safety one bit. It doesn't do anything for it. So we think we, we, we are committed to trying to have patient safety. He's providing these grants to try to make patient safety a priority, and we thank the president for doing that. Okay, uh, Dr. Altman talked a little bit about where things are at in Congress right now. You've got the bill that came out of the Senate Finance Committee this last week. It creates a national insurance exchange. It has an individual mandate to buy insurance, subsidies for low-income people. No denials for uh, pre-existing conditions uh, the, the, for, and caps on, on payment for conditions. It does not re repeal the Medicare physician payment formula that I talked with you about, uh, and uh, it, uh, it only fixes it for one year. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we are working with the senators to try to fix the Medicare payment system. The House, uh, the House bill, there was the tri-committee version. That was H.R. 3200, which we supported. Uh, there are still, in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee, 50 or 60 amendments, and I have no idea what they are, but there's lots of amendments. Uh, they are pending. They may go as a separate bill. Uh, the leadership of the House, the Rules Committee, uh, are all going to negotiate to bring a, a bill to the full House for debate. It will probably occur after the Senate finishes its work. I think they'll wait later in the month. Uh, and there will be a separate vote on a single-payer uh, system in the House. And then after the House finishes its work, it'll go to conference committee with the Senate. Uh, on the Senate side, uh, the HELP Committee in the Senate has already finished its work. Uh, it also has 180 amendments. I certainly don't know what those are, but we'll see what happens with those. Uh, the Finance Committee has acted on its bill. Uh, they'll, melt, they'll meld those two bills in some way and get that then to the Senate floor for a vote and then go to conference committee. Well, breaking news is that uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow uh, this last week uh, announced the introduction of Senate Bill 1776. This is a bill to fix the Medicare payment formula that I told you about. It would wipe out all the previous debt, get us back to ground zero, get rid of that, uh, that tr uh, terrific grill on our back in terms of the Medicare payment formula. And there are actually going to be, uh, I know this is a scholarly panel here, but I've got to tell you, if you want to do something that's going to help physicians and help seniors, get on the phone and call your senators, tell them to support 1776. Uh, I don't think either of your senators currently is on board with this. This would repeal the Medicare payment formula. It would get this off the table and let us have a reasonable payment to physicians so that we don't have to worry every year about uh, seniors' access to care. So there's lots of ways to call your senators. There's actually going to be a vote probably tomorrow. Uh, it, it takes 60 votes to get this through the Senate. There will be a couple of more votes. On the House side, they've already, in the House bill, it already repeals that Medicare formula. So if we've get it, got it out of the Senate and we've got it out of the House, we are hopefully going to be successful with that. Okay, so it's a very complicated, it's very complicated to get a bill to the, to the president. You've got the, the three committees in the House. They've got to go, go to the House floor. You've got the committees in the Senate, Senate floor, conference committee, and then finally to the president. So it is a very difficult and convoluted process, uh, certainly not pure by any means, and it is sausage making at its best. But uh, it, it is moving along at this time. Okay, so... Um, what do I think is going to happen? Uh, the, the Congress is going to shift the dials on you know, how many they want to cover. And as, as Dr. Altman mentioned, it's not covering everyone. So they're going to dial that. How much is it going to cost? Uh, you know, how much is the individual mandate going to be? All those dials will be adjusted and to try to get to something that will actually pass both, both the House and the Senate. Uh, the key insurance reforms require universal coverage. And you saw this last week. There was pushback from the health plans because their original idea was that everyone would be in the risk pool, and now it's not going to be everyone, so they're saying, you know, it's going to be more costly. We'll see what happens with that. There might be adjustments there also. You know, perhaps there will be some different kind of a phase-in approach than what they have now. Uh, but all those dials will be adjusted as things go forward uh, in, in the Congress. 
Now, a couple of big uh, gorillas in the room that I really were not talking about, but um, if, oh, I've got one minute? Okay, then I can talk really quick. Um, 50%, about 50% of our healthcare expenditures of the $2 trillion are in health behaviors that are preventable. Obesity, tobacco, alcohol, sexually transmitted diseases, violence, and so on. So we have to make sure that we, and when you talk about healthcare costs, we've got to take care of that. I think everyone agrees with that. That's something we need to work on. The other thing about primary care physicians in the House bill, there are incentives for primary care physicians. That's good. Uh, we've got a lot more specialists than primary care physicians. Clearly, we have to do more for primary care. Uh, different ways of paying, as Dr. Altman mentioned. We're looking at accountable care organizations. We, we have to pay physicians and health systems in a different way. Absolutely agree about comparative effectiveness. We are supportive of comparative effectiveness. Um, final thoughts. We think the bill's going to get written. We think it's going to be signed by the president. We are supportive of a bill getting, bill getting written this year. We want health system reform to get passed this year. There have been health system reform efforts over the last 70 years, all of which have been virtually unsuccessful. So we want to get things done this year. We don't think it's time to wait for a perfect bill. This is not a perfect bill. It's not going to satisfy everyone, but we want to make sure that health system reform gets passed this year. Thank you very much.